<笑>鬼岛之音 ，Ghost Island Media。Apple has the biggest podcast app in the world, and Apple has a plan to be carbon neutral by 2030 for their stores, their packaging, and their products. But what about podcasts? Apple Podcasts has no climate category, unlike true crime or history or fiction. So, podcasters across the world, from the U.S. to Taiwan, India to Australia, are signing an open letter to Apple, asking for a climate category. A climate category. A climate category. By Earth Day, April twenty second. So, whether you're a podcast maker or a podcast listener, please. Go to podcastersdeclare dot com and sign, and nudge your favorite shows to do the same. Because we would love a carbon neutral Apple by twenty thirty. But we'd love more people listening to podcasts about climate right, right now. now, right now, right now. Podcastersdeclare dot com. Hello, folks. This is Nature Nate, and surprise, we're not dead. I know you thought that might have happened, but we aren't. And、uh, although life in Taiwan is relatively easy without a roaring plague, life itself is still hard. So here's some content for you. This is Waste Not Why Not by Ghost Island Media, a show on sustainability science and how not to save the environment. I'm your host, Nature Nate, a sustainability consultant working on energy, ocean, and waste issues. Ocean. I just want to highlight that that I'm an expert about the ocean. I've published papers about it. Okay. It's time for another Nate take. It's not a hot take. It's a Nate take. And this Nate take, I'm going to debunk, debunking, sea spiracy. What? Okay, so before we begin, if you're new or you just are listening randomly to this show, you know it's about how not. To save the environment, and when I first came up with this idea, I was a pretty angry person about greenwashing and the dismal state of the environmental movement, where anyone in marketing could easily deceive people on Kickstarter and make any kind of greenwashed product they want. And with all this context in mind, Seaspiracy comes out. Seaspiracy is the new Netflix environmental documentary. Full of misinformation. It came out in March of 2021, and it supposedly exposes a mega conspiracy within the global fishing industry. Now, this would only be a conspiracy if you had never in your life looked into fishing or where fish came from. I didn't want to watch this. I didn't want to watch this documentary. I don't like most environmental documentaries because they're kind of just like environmental porn. They just show you something grotesque, and they just want to get a reaction out of you. So I already knew what this was going to be about. I've seen Planet of the Humans. I've seen End of the Line, The Cove, Blackfish. I've seen all the environmental documentaries. I don't, I don't know how to say that any other way. So first off, you can tell this is going to be bad, and you can tell this is going to be inaccurate just because of the name. Why did they call it conspiracy? Right? It's just, it's just obvious. Like it just, it doesn't even like seaspiracy. It's just come on. But they called it seaspiracy because it is. Kind of the spiritual successor, and it's produced by the same person who made Cowspiracy, which is actually kind of a witty title, and which is also an extremely popular, full of lies nature documentary. In that documentary, they claim that they're going to expose the real enemy of sustainability, which is cows. And their sort of claim to fame is that animal agriculture, and specifically cows, are responsible for 51 percent of global warming. This is a bad number because it is wrong, and it is also, at its face, an improbable number. If you just pause for a moment and think about animals, cows specifically, being 51 percent the cause behind global warming, that would mean that all of the gas stations, planes, buildings, coal mines, power plants, textiles, video games, every aspect of industrialized society is not nearly as bad as a cow. That just does not. Pass any kind of initial logical assessment, and the same is true for seaspiracy. However, seaspiracy is done in a slightly more sophisticated way. As such, I think it's able to trick many people. And the unfortunate thing is that seaspiracy, like cowspiracy, actually is making a valid point. Animal agriculture and cows 
are really bad for the environment. And they are a huge impact. They're around 18% of emissions if you kind of take a high look at it from agriculture. The number is debatable because it's extremely difficult to calculate the environmental impact of every farm. The same is true for Seaspiracy. So Seaspiracy's thesis is that industrialized fishing is the true threat that is destroying the oceans through the nets that they discard and through the bycatch of dolphins and whales and sharks. They're wrecking the ocean with unsustainable levels of fishing. That's true. When I first watched Seaspiracy, I was angry that the facts that I've known since I was in high school are being presented as breakthroughs that the filmmaker is heroically exposing to the greater public. It was on Google the whole time, guys. I was angry as I tried to watch this Netflix documentary after work that the average viewer of environmental documentaries somehow turn off their logical defenses when they watch a documentary like Seaspiracy. I mean, within one minute, the movie is made by a company called Ohm Productions. And then the guy admits that he became a plastic cop. He was going to criticize people for using straws. And they say there's no such thing as sustainable fishing. We know this is false. Humans have lived on Earth for a long time eating fish. There are indigenous people who eat fish, and they do so in a way that is sustainable. They have not eaten themselves out of existence. There are indigenous people who set up marine protected areas. They don't call them that. They call them taboo areas, or they just won't harvest certain fish certain times of the year. In Taiwan, on Orchid Island, there are people who harvest flying fish only certain times of the year when they're most abundant. So fishing at face value is not intrinsically bad. Industrialized fishing is probably always going to be bad because of just the nature of having giant fossil fuel powered boats with multi-kilometer long fishing nets. Now, I could sit here and I could debunk it like I'm starting to. And that is my gut reaction is to just debunk things. But I'm not listening to my own advice when I do that. I've realized that me debunking things is the equivalent of a beach cleanup. I feel better afterwards, but I'm really only scraping the surface of the problem. As I was watching this and I was reflecting, I felt the need to have a Nate take, to have a hot take, to debunk him, to dunk on him, to call out that they were racist for calling Hong Kong Shark Fin City, that they were misquoting information about plastic pollution, that they were confusing correlation and causation, that they were claiming that sustainable seafood is impossible. All these lies, I wanted to go and debunk them because it made me feel good. But that's not how to make things change. If I just go and debunk every incorrect environmental documentary that exists, that's going to be my job for the rest of my life. And when I debunk something, I am recreating this intellectual dependency and I'm just substituting another charismatic white dude who cares about the environment with another charismatic white dude who cares about the environment and has slightly different opinions. And this time, I was also angry at myself because I wasn't really acknowledging what was happening and what has happened with Waste Not Why Not over these past two years. What started out as a wannabe Planet Money greenwashing show has since morphed into, I think, a fairly interesting interview show interspersed with occasional educational rants. So, as our show is about to turn two years old, I'm probably not going to be debunking things anymore. In fact, if I look at the things about this show that are best, it is when we present interesting people and interesting stories and what is actually happening for the environment. Because when I have to spend time debunking something, I'm necessarily taking that energy away from something else. And that is the whole thesis behind the show. We should not be concerned with individual actions to save the environment. We should not be concerned with these grand gestures. We should instead be creating systemic change. And I cannot create systemic change if I'm spending all this time creating a cudgel to beat Seaspiracy with. It just doesn't work. My dream of, you know, debunking and calling out greenwashing and what is essentially fighting people who are already on my side is some ways just a toxic reaction to my own lack of progress. I thought that by the time I had turned 31, we would be better off. <laughs> I thought that maybe I would have even saved the environment by now. It still feels bad to spend more than 10 years of your life trying to improve the world and things just keep getting worse. But if you watch Seaspiracy or a documentary like it and accept it at face value, then me debunking it will not help you. If you watched Planet of the Humans, another terrible documentary, without doing your own research, and you believe renewables are in fact somehow bad, I can't help you. This isn't for me to do. I can only share what I know, what I think about the world, what I've learned through my decade plus of environmental work, 
I can share the people, the books that have helped me learn and change my opinion about ecology and sustainability so that you can educate yourself in what is hopefully a more friendly and maybe even funny way. So I won't sit here and debunk Seaspiracy line by line, partially because if you just listen to their centralized message and you just forget literally every single fact they told you, then you're fine. Their central message is industrialized fishing is bad. If you walk away from Seaspiracy and that's all you take away, then great. So, and I don't want to leave you with nothing. I don't want you to just go, well, Nate said Seaspiracy is bad. So let's talk about what industrialized fishing really is. Industrialized fishing, for many, is a form of power. It's a form of international legitimacy. Why do you think China sends thousands of fishing boats into the South China Sea? Why do you think that the U.S. would build up industrialized fishing fleets in a post-World War II economy? Because fishing isn't really about fish. Why does Japan catch whales and dolphins? So they can go and catch tuna later. So it's not really about food. It's about control. And it's also about money. International industrialized fishing is an extremely subsidized industry. If you read the World Bank and the UNFAO's study, The Sunken Billions, which was written in 2008, you would know that most high seas fishing, if not all, is basically directly subsidized. In Taiwan, it's an open secret that the heavily subsidized fishing industry here will sail to China and exchange subsidized fishing fuel for fish. This was told to me by someone who works in the fisheries department in Taiwan who would not publicly say this because he would lose his job. And because high seas destructive fishing is so heavily subsidized, think about it. You have to buy nets. You have to buy boats. You have to buy fuel. You have to repair those boats. The ocean is uh, rough, so you have to really repair those boats a lot. You have to hire people. No one wants to do the work, so you have to trick people into working for you. And that's how you end up with slaves. So what we find is that actually this type of fishing is extremely expensive and capital dependent. And therefore, if we have a carbon tax, which is something we need anyway to stop climate change, we will also effectively stop overfishing. Because if these fishing boats have to pay for their dirty fuel and they have to pay more for their destructive nets that persist in the ocean for decades, then they probably won't do it. And many of them will probably go out of business. So... When we only take one narrow look at something, we miss out on opportunities to improve entire systems. And even if you were successful in destroying industrialized overfishing, you would create a humanitarian crisis because now you would have millions and millions of people who have no job, skilled in an industry that is gone, in rural areas with limited other economic opportunities. It is not a matter of just ending overfishing. We need to create a sustainable and viable alternative so that these people can live doing the thing that they love, which is being close to the ocean. Some of them could probably do ecotourism. Some of them could assist in science. In any case, that will require an extreme level of public and government support. Becoming vegan is something that's great. It's great to eat less meat or no meat at all. It is not a panacea. It is not a silver bullet. We need many different types of solutions. And presenting something as complex, as interwoven with international politics, interwoven with the Navy, with warfare, as Asian people eating sharks is a really dangerous and overly simplistic narrative. So just in case you didn't listen to anything I said and you want one simple trick to stop industrialized fishing forever, the best thing that you can do is to... Find out where your food comes from. Don't just eat random tuna. Don't just eat like random tuna from Subway. Go talk to a fisherman. There are things called like community supported fisheries where it's like community supported agriculture. They have them in Monterey. You can like pay a set amount of money every month like Netflix, but you can get sustainably sourced fish and they pay the fishermen directly. It's like boat to table sustainable seafood. If you're going to eat fish, just find out where it's from. And I don't mean just like read the back. I mean like spend some time and energy to know where your food comes from. If you are so busy or poor that you cannot do that, I feel you, then don't worry about it. <laughs> just tell your rich friends to go buy you some sustainably sourced clams. Another tip, if you don't have a choice for whatever reason or you're just too busy, is eat vegetarians. Vegetarian fish, eat fish that eat plants, eat clams, eat things without spinal cords. It's almost always going to be better for the environment, except for shrimp. Shrimp have a really high bycatch rate. Most other things are fine. But if you're in Taiwan, don't eat oysters. You can't get a simple tip. There's just no way. 
everything you do is, is going to hurt the environment. So that's it. There is no easy solution to the environment. You can't just fly to Japan and stop whaling. I would know. I flew to Taiwan and I tried to save the corals here. And I too, like the director of Seaspiracy, found actual conspiracies here and actual crime and straight up corruption and gangsters and a really complex, really, really complex situation interwoven with indigenous fishing practices. But because I came here to Taiwan, I realized this wasn't something I could solve single-handedly as someone who just parachuted in from the other side of the world. Sure, I eat less meat than I did when I was younger, and I barely drive, and I mostly bike. But my real positive impact, which is probably more important than being less bad, my real positive impact is working with diverse groups of Taiwanese and international communities to drive change at scale. To make change happen, I have to first build or find a community to be a part of. One last anecdote to close out the show. At therapy, in my workshop, there was a Chinese-American businessman, worked in China for a really long time, and he spent probably 10 minutes during one of the workshop breaks telling me how much he loved shark fin soup. And he tried to make the case that eating shark is fine. I let the rage pass. I noticed my feeling and I moved on because it was a fucking mindfulness retreat. Later on, on another break at the beach, he walked up to me, picked up the trash that he'd found on the beach and showed it to me, genuinely expecting approval. I just laughed and went in the water. This has been a Ghost Island Media Production. This episode is produced by Yu Chen Lai, myself, Nature Nate. Our executive producer is Emily Y. Wu, edited by Yu Chen Lai. Thanks for listening. Bye bye, Nate. Get it? It's like an email. Did you know Norway catches more whales than Japan and Iceland combined? The director certainly didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> See, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it feels so satisfying, but it's so hollow. Dunking on these movies is like eating McDonald's. Anyway, you might have also heard about this thing called Podcasters Declare. Look it up. Google it. It's a thing. We're trying to get Apple Podcasts to have a climate category before Earth Day. This is your last chance to sign up and tell your friends to help climate podcasts like us reach more people. Easy to do. Just sign up. You probably watched Seaspiracy. You wasted an hour and a half of your life. You can take a minute to go to podcastersdeclare.com to do it.